News of the Times, Wicked Wednesdays, an Irish assassin story. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at one brother's hiring of a father and son to kill his older brother. This story from 1837 recounts the hiring of friends for payment to kill his older brother, the inheritor of the family farm. The father and son team duly come up with a plot to lure the elder brother, farm owner, away on his own. The Lure A story that the young and very wealthy Miss Wynne nearby allegedly wishes nothing more but to elope with the intended victim and promises to bring with her, as her dowry, some £500. That's worth approximately £15,000. In 2024. As intended, the story ensues that the intended victim departs his home. As the victim cannot believe his luck and outfits himself in his very best clothing, he doesn't realise that an ignominious death awaits that will end with his dead body being dumped into the local river. We take a look at the background the crime and the capture of the father and son team of assassins in today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. Background. We begin in County Carlow in Southern Ireland in 1837 with two families, the McGraths and the Aylward. The McGrath. The McGraths were a respectable family with some tenuous links to a substantial family in Wexford. Older son Richard McGrath, who had lived with his father when he passed, and who was also the executor of the will, gained the substantial property left by his father. The estate was a nursery, similar to a 21st century garden centre or arboreum, and was, by all accounts, quite successful. Richard continued to live on the property and had been there several years after the passing of the father before the incident occurred. Younger brother William McGrath was working in Carlow at the time of his father's death. We don't know what the impetus was for him to return to his childhood neighbourhood, but he does return and stays in the home of Edward and James Aylward. Edward Aylward is the father of the household, and James, the younger son, is a long-time friend of William's. Upon William's return, he is seen to have had a physical altercation with his older brother Richard, and has been heard loudly swearing that he would have the property when Richard was dead. The Aylwards Aylwards Sr. had worked previously as a shoemaker and as a butcher. He had a wife, three daughters, and his younger son, James. We have no record of any antagonism between Aylward and Richard McGrath, unless, of course, there was some jealousy involved. Certainly, the payment of £100 would have been a financial incentive to kill Richard McGrath, worth approximately £14,500 in 2024. Miss Wynne Miss Wynne of Kelly Mount came from a good family which would have been worth a goodly dowry. There are some reports of both Richard and Miss Wynne having met each other in the past, and that Richard had expressed his interest, but that his interest had been shut down by Miss Wynne's father. The excuse concocted to get Richard McGrath to leave his house and go out alone was by stating that Miss Wynne had indicated to the Aylwards that her father would be gone to Dublin for a few days with a butter delivery and that she was very ready to elope with Richard McGrath. This supposed elopement was relayed by the Aylwards to coax Richard to go and collect Miss Wynne for the anticipated elopement. The Aylwards would come with Richard to help carry her trunks and baggage. There was no elopement planned, and Miss Wynne had not sent any communication to Richard of any sort, and knew nothing at all about any kind 
of elope. The crime. Richard's body is discovered in the river Barrow. He is fully dressed in his very best attire. A post-mortem is ordered where it is clear to the surgeon that Richard died from strangulation or suffocation. It is a very clear case of murder and not possible suicide. From here, police go to Richard's residence only to find his brother installed and behaving as if the property is his. Questioning of the maid and local neighbours lead the police to the potential culpability of William McGrath, known to have had a contentious relationship with his brother, and the Aylwards, known to be the last persons to have seen Richard alive. From the Saunders newsletter, the 8th of July, 1837, Carlo Assizes, Dreadful Case of Franticide. At an early hour this morning, the court was crowded to excess with persons anxious to hear the trial of a young man named McGrath, who was charged with the murder of his own brother. There were two other persons named Aylward, father and son, who were charged as accomplices and who were to take their trial along with him. The circumstances connected with the case excited a great deal of interest throughout the whole country. The two were put to the front of the dock. McGrath is a young man, apparently about 26, very respectably dressed, very fair complexion, rather handsome. The elder Aylwood was a meek-looking old man with a look of resignation and firmness, which was by no means the characteristic of a cruel or bad disposition. His son had much more the aspect of a man possessing a hardened disposition than the other two. They all bore their awful situation with the utmost firmness and composure. They were perfectly unmoved whilst they heard the indictment read, which charged them with having, through malice, prepense murdered Richard McGrath by casting him on the ground and then placing a handkerchief over his mouth by which he was suffocated, and that, when life was extinct, that they cast him into the river Barrow. They pleaded not guilty. The evidence begins with the housekeeper to Richard McGrath, Mary. She recounts the day before Richard's disappearance, and setting up the meal with young Aylward, her master Richard, and a neighbour. While serving the meal, she overhears... Richard being told the news that Miss Wynne wishes to elope with him whilst her father is away in Dublin. She goes on to give evidence that two days after Richard goes away with the Awards, never to be seen again alive, Richard's brother William moves into the farm and takes over, behaving exactly as if the property is his. Mary McGrath examined stated she lived as housekeeper with Richard McGrath. She confirms she was no relation of his, states that she recollects the evening before her employer Richard was brought away from his own house. She deposes young Aylward came there, and when he came in, he said he wanted Mr McGrath. She pointed over to the nursery where he was at work and said, There he is. He went over to him, and both came in shortly after. Her master then sent her to the town of Ross for some tea, sugar, and bread. When she came home, she prepared supper for them. They had plenty of beefsteaks, tea and punch, and some spirits after the tea. A man named Jacob, a near neighbour, was at supper with them. She was going in and out, attending them and heard the conversation that was passing. Aylward said that Miss Wynne of Kellymount, at whose father's house he visited some time previously, was ready to run away with him, and that she sent him, Aylward, with a message to Richard to that effect. That her father was to go to Dublin, or was gone to Dublin, with butter, and that he, Aylward, was the man who would assist on the occasion. 
Aylward slept there that night, and in the same bed with McGrath. They breakfasted in the morning, and then went away together. She knew the prisoner, William McGrath. He came to his brother's house two or three days after Richard went away with Aylward. William came at night and remained there up to the time he was taken into custody by the police. He acted in the same way her master would have acted if he were there. William went to the fair of Ennis Corthy and sold a horse. William paid the workman in the nursery. The neighbour next door gives evidence. From the Saunders newsletter, the 8th of July, 1837, Carlo Assizes. Dreadful case of fratricide. John Jacob examined. This lived at Ross Barton, very near to where the deceased Richard McGrath lived. He was his near neighbour. He recollects the 7th of last September. McGrath sent over for him that evening and asked him to go take tea with him. When he went there, the supper was nearly ready. There was plenty of tea, beef steaks and punch during supper. And when it was over, young Aylward, who was also there, began speaking of a match for Mr. Richard. He said that Miss Wynne of Kellymount sent him over with a message to him and that she was ready to run away with McGrath and that she had £500 or £600 that she could lay her hands on and that he would carry out the trunks and assist in the elopement whilst her father was away in Dublin with butter. The witness, the neighbour John Jacob, remained a couple of hours. He saw them the next morning going off together soon after breakfast. Mr. Richard was elegantly dressed. He had on a dark coat, yellow vest, light-coloured trousers, a new hat with crepe on it, and new shoes with buckles in them. He recollects seeing the prisoner William McGrath at his brother's house sometime in August or July previously, they had a quarrel on one of the walks in the nursery and gave some blows. William pulled out a hook and swore by it that he would be there and have the property when he was dead. Their father was a couple of years dead, and Richard, having lived with him, administered to his will and was in possession over the property. William was at that time in business in Carlo. The father was a nursery man and was looked upon as a very respectable man, having a good deal of property. The brother William came there to the property in a couple of days after Richard's disappearance and assumed the ownership of the place. Witness inquired if he knew where his brother was and William swore a great oath that he knew nothing whatever of him. More witnesses are called who confirm the previous testimony. Landlords of an inn confirm seeing the Aylwoods and the now deceased brother Richard McGrath travelling together and requesting beds for the night in their inn. Much excitement arises with the calling of Miss Wynne to give testimony. From the Saunders newsletter, the 8th of July, 1837, Carlo Assizes, Dreadful Case of Fratricide. Miss Wynne, the young lady from whom the pretended message was sent to the deceased, was called up. She was very respectably attired and was rather an interesting young woman. She swore that she never saw the prisoner, William McGrath, and that she never sent a message by him or any other person to Richard McGrath. She remembered Richard McGrath calling once or twice to her father's, and she believed it to be upon a matrimonial speculation. Her father did not countenance it, and he did not come again. He got a letter from him once, but she never answered it. Things look bleak for William McGrath, and he can see that the case is going against him. Unofficially, he gives testimony to a Captain Young, stating that it was the Aylwards who killed his brother, but that they made him promise to give them a hundred pounds. The last witness to give evidence for the prosecution is the surgeon, Dr. Malcolmson, who confirms his opinion that death was caused by strangulation or suffocation before immersion in the water. 
His reasoning is due to the state of the face, which was much swollen with protruding eyes. The prosecution rests its case. The defence offers no witnesses. The jury retires and is absent a mere forty minutes before returning to pronounce a verdict of guilty against all prisoners. From the Kilkenny moderator, the 2nd of August, 1837, the execution of William McGrath and Edward Aylwood. On Thursday last, the above unhappy men underwent the awful sentence of the law in front of the county jail for the willful murder of Richard McGrath. On the previous night, both the culprits slept soundly and partook of some tea the next morning. McGrath, who was the last of a respectable family and connected by marriage with an influential family in the county of Wexford, was about twenty-nine years of age, of genteel appearance and soft and pleasing countenance. McGrath believes he still has a chance of commutation, if not reprieve. He sets about demonstrating a renewed religious fervour and writes a letter giving out his side of the events of the fateful night of his brother's death. The press, with great reluctance, publish the letter as requested by the good reverend who has been working with William McGrath. From the Kilkenny moderator, the 2nd of August, 1837, execution of William McGrath and Edward Aylwood. William McGrath laboured under the strong delusion until a few days before his execution and clung with desperation to the hope that his friends would obtain some mitigation in his sentence. In order to effect this, he received some religious friends who had constantly visited him by framing the statement which he forwarded us by publication last Saturday. Indeed, so firmly did they believe his story of his not knowing of the murder until two minutes after it was perpetrated, although we pointed out the discrepancies in the statement and the improbability of the entire story. Nevertheless, with the most humane views of rescuing his memory for some portion of guilt attached to it and to restore peace to a troubled conscience whilst living, they requested a publication of his letter, to which we very reluctantly consented. William and both father and son Aylwards are set to die by execution. Finally realising that there will be no reprieve, William confesses, stating that James Aylward, the son, knew nothing of the matter. From the Kilkenny Moderator, the 2nd of August, 1837, the execution of William McGrath and Edward Aylwood. On the Sunday night following, he, William McGrath, admitted the statement to be false, and he fully confessed his being a principal in the murder, and that it was concocted between him and Edward Aylwood, and that the son, James Aylwood, did not know of their intention to commit the deed until a few minutes after the murder was committed. He declared that his object was to get his brother's property. That Aylward Senior was to get £100, and in order to achieve his design, they had decoyed the brother from Ross on pretense of eloping with Miss Wynne, and had strangled him and then threw his body into the river barrow. After having made his full confession, he became perfectly calm, penitent, and resigned to his fate. A respite of young Aylward until further orders were forwarded from the castle on Monday, and as McGrath confessed that he was unacquainted with the conspiracy to perpetrate the murder until a few minutes before the foul deed was committed, we entertained then most sanguine hopes that his sentence would be commuted to transportation to life, more particularly because he had been the first to give the particulars of the murder after his arrest. The Execution Despite torrential rain, it was estimated that some 2,000 people came to watch 
the public execution of both William McGrath and Edward Aylwood. The two are hung one hour apart from each other. William McGrath's execution at 12 noon goes without any problems, and there is much praise as to how stoically he met his doom, as well as the good manners of the spectators. Edward Aylwood's execution one hour later is a different matter. Edward has the noose placed around his neck, the trap door is opened, and Edward falls to the ground, the rope not having been secured above. Torrents of abuse is shouted to the executioner as he then attempts to haul Edward Aylwood up through the trapdoor by the rope. With the possibility of the crowd rushing in, the execution stops this attempt, and Edward must once again climb the stairs to the top of the scaffold to be hung again. The execution of Aylwood, awful scene. At one o'clock, the elder Aylwood left his cell accompanied by the Reverend. He appeared to be a man of sixty years of age. He was by profession a shoemaker, but had also practised as a butcher. He walked with some difficulty and was greatly exhausted on reaching the scaffold. To those who were near him, he appeared perfectly indifferent to what was passing. The executioner, having adjusted the rope around his neck, withdrew the bolt. The unhappy man fell to the ground and received a slight contusion on his forehead. This awful scene occurred in consequence of the executioner having omitted to put the check on the windlass and consequently the rope wound to the ground which occasioned the fall. The horror of those who were near the spot may be easily managed, but the yells of execration from the crowd against the executioner on his attempting to raise him up against the windlass exceeded anything we have ever heard. The unfortunate man was not hurt, and in a few minutes he was again brought inside the gate. When he walked with considerable firmness one flight of stairs a second time and into the room. The rope being again adjusted, he was launched into eternity and died without a struggle. The rain continued to pour down in torrents until three o'clock, but the crowd did not disperse until the body of Aylwood, after being suspended the usual time, was conveyed to the jail infirmary. The bodies were interred on the same evening within the jail walls. Aylwood had a wife, three daughters, and the son, who was Respa. That concludes this Wicked Wednesday Irish assassin story. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful, where we look at crimes in a location such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. If you like this channel, you may be interested in our sister channel, Chronicle of the Times, where we offer a lighter side of Victorian and Edwardian news stories, as well as a weekly podcast of stories from authors of the day, such as Dickens, Collins, Benson and Conan Doyle. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.